Hello, welcome back to our third and final video on BGP. You'll recall that we discussed briefly in the last video the fact that if you make policy changes, those policy changes will only be in effect as of the time they are implemented. Any routes that were sent out before the policy change, any routes that were received before the policy change will not have the policy applied to them. You'll recall that we talked about one way to ensure that the policy does apply to all routes would be to shut down the neighbor connection and bring it back up again. But we mentioned that that was a rather draconian approach. It means reestablishing TCP sessions between the two. Uh, that's going to take time. There's going to be an outage of communication, if you will, until you've established the relationship again. Again, there are two parts to this. If you make changes to the MED that you wish to advertise to your neighbor, for example, that would be outbound information, and you would have to resend your BGP table to the neighbor. If you're making changes to incoming information, then you need to have the neighbor resend its BGP table so that it's good, the routes are going to pass through the new filter. So in addition to that neighbor shutdown we talked about earlier, three different ways to trigger an update would be hard reset, soft reset, and route refresh. As with the shutdown, the hard reset using a clear IP BGP asterisk to have hard reset of all neighbors or clear IP BGP and specific neighbor's address that you wish to have cleared will wind up removing all BGP routes either learned by all neighbors or by that specific neighbor from your routing table. And it will inform the neighbor or neighbors that we're resetting the connection. It's going to take up to a minute, possibly, for the BGP sessions to be reestablished. Um, part of that is going to be that the neighbor is going to be resending you um, their routing table. Part of that is that the neighbor is sending you all of the paths that it knows about. And BGP will then apply the new filters to the path that it learns. Now, for this half a minute to a minute, we're not going to be able to forward packets to the neighbors. So you can imagine end users looking at this and for half a minute trying to refresh their pages. They try to download web pages from the neighbor that they can't communicate with. They would not be very happy. Another problem. You want to use this asterisk with care. So we'll assume router A has eight neighbors, and each neighbor is sending its full internet table. At this point already, that table, the internet table is over half a gigabyte in size. Exactly how large it is at the time you listen to this, you could determine on your own with a little bit of uh, searching. But I'm just going to use the generic N. The internet table is N megabytes in size. If we use clear IP BGP asterisk, A is going to be receiving eight times gigabytes of data that it's going to be needing to store in RAM. It's going to be consuming a lot of bandwidth here. It's going to need to be processing all of this information. And again, we're consuming memory, we're consuming CPU cycles, we're consuming bandwidth, and we're having a lot of time during which users will not be able to communicate with the outside world. A much better practice, even if you wish to have the policies apply to all of the neighbors, instead of having it apply to all of the neighbors all at once, clear each neighbor in turn. A better approach would be a soft reset. Now let's first look at soft resets if you've made changes to outbound policies. Here, we make clear IP BGP and then either asterisk or a specific neighbor address, and then soft out. What this will do is it will force the router to send the neighbor or neighbors in question new updates for its whole table. You're not bringing down your BGP sessions at all. So you're not going to be having times during which the users will not be able to communicate with the outside world. It doesn't consume a whole lot of memory. Um, if you're making changes only to outbound policies, this is definitely the best way to go. This will not help you, though, if your policy changes were for inbound policies. With inbound policies, you have two different options for soft resets. 
One would be to say, before you actually do the clearing of the information, any information from the most recent updates you've received from the neighbor or neighbors in question, then issue the clear IP, BGP, asterisk, or neighbor address soft in command. And then you will not have to have the neighbor or neighbors send up an update. Instead, you'll use that stored information, apply the policies, and go from there. And you could do that with the neighbor IP address soft dash reconfiguration inbound command. You'd issue this command, make your policy changes, then you would issue this command. And because you issued neighbor soft reconfiguration inbound command, RTA will just use saved data and apply the policies to the saved data. But if you don't use that command, then when you issue the clear IP BGP neighbor address soft in command or clear IP or clear IP BGP asterisk soft in command, then you'll basically be asking neighbors, please send me updates. And the neighbors will then send updates to you. But you will not have to reset the BGP connection. So you have the advantage over hard resets without having set the BGP connection. But you're still going to be using up a lot of memory. You're still going to be using up a lot of bandwidth. Therefore, the best practice would be go ahead and issue the neighbor soft reconfiguration inbound command before issuing the clear IP BG soft in command. If you wish to find out information after you've done a soft reset, here are some commands that you could use. Show IP BGP neighbors, and then you can specify that for your a particular neighbor, whether you'd like to display all of the routes that you're using the neighbor, whether or not you're actually using them, whether you'd like to display the routes that you have advertised to your neighbors. And again, if you just issue show IP BGP, you're going to see in your entire BGP table. So let's look at some sample BGP configurations. Here, things are about as basic as you're going to be getting. Each router is establishing a neighbor relationship with the other router. The AS numbers are different, so it's an eBGP relationship. Each without advertising a network that it knows about to its BGP peer. So here we have a slightly more complex setup. B is in an E BGP relationship with A. Our time the system numbers are different. It's in an I BGP relationship with C, and specifically using C's loop address, and using its own loopback address as the source of its communications with router C. It's advertising three different networks that it knows about one of which is making use of the mask. We'll talk about that synchronization later on in this video. And it's advertising its own loopback address via EIGRP, so C will know how to reach its loopback address. You can read this slide on your own. It discusses a lot of the different commands that can be used for verifying and troubleshooting BGP. The next several slides are actually going to be looking at each of these in greater detail. First of all, our old friend show IP BGP. We've already discussed parts of the output. Now we're going to be looking at the rest. We talked about the origin code, how BGP first learned about the network, uh, whether it learned about it through a network command, whether it was a redistributed command, whether it learned about it via the EGP protocol that's named EGP. We talked about the status codes. The asterisk means that the next top address listed is a valid one. We talked about the fact that the greater than symbol means that this is the preferred route to the network, and it's the one that's going to be advertised to the neighbors, and the one that's going to be put in its routing table. You can go ahead and read about the additional possible codes, such as the R, on this slide on your own. R meaning RIB failure, for example, meaning that the route was not installed to the routing table. And we'll be looking at show IP BGP RIB failure on the later slide. Just talked about the greater than. The third column is going to either be blank or have an I in it. If it's blank, it means that the route was learned from an external peer via E BGP. If it has an I, it means that it was learned from an internal peer via I BGP. The fourth column is the one that actually lists the networks. 
and the fifth column lists next hops to get to that network. So we can see that for 10.1.0.0, we've got two different possible paths. The first path has 0, 0.0.0 as the next hop. That means that this path actually originated on this router itself. And then the second one was learned via 10.1.0.2. The next three columns deal with the W, L, M of our W lamb, the metric, local preference, and weight. And then finally, our path to get to the network. So the first number here is going to be the autonomous system number that's first to us along the path. So if we were going to be sending something to 10.97.97.1, it would first leave our autonomous system and go to AS64998. Then from there, it will go to AS64997. And then finally, find its way to 10.97.97.1. So this last AS is the originating AS. If there are no ASs listed, it means that the route came originally from the same AS as router A. And in our last video, we already talked about the very, very last character that we're going to use. That if it's an I, it means that the route was originally introduced into BGP with a network command, in all likelihood. And you're not likely to see an E here, because an E means that the route was originally introduced into EGP via the EGP protocol that's named EGP. Again, because that protocol is a legacy protocol, you're probably not going to be seeing an E there. A question mark means that BGP is not sure how that route was originally learned. In all likelihood, it means that the route was redistributed from an IGP or from a static route or directly connected route into BGP. I made mention earlier that we'd be talking about the shell IP BGP rig failure command. So here we can see some output. We can see that the reason why 172.31.1.0 and 172.31.11.0 not be had not been entered into our routing table is because the router already knew about these routes from some other source that had a lower administrative distance, and it was those other sources information that was entered into the routing table. Show IP BGP summary can be used to verify your neighbor relationship. So we have these three as neighbors. We can also show you what your router ID happens to be, what your AS number happens to be, what version of the table it was current, and every time there are changes to the BGP table, this number is going to be incremented. What is the last version of the BGP database that was injected into the main routing table? Again, the IP address of the neighbor as specified in your neighbor statement. Which version of BGP your neighbor is using, and typically that's going to be four. What your autonomous system number is. How many messages you've received from the neighbor and sent to the neighbor. Which version of the BGP table the neighbor is using. Which version of your BGP table was last sent to your neighbor. How many BGP messages from the neighbor are waiting to be processed and how many BGP messages you're sending to the neighbor are waiting to be sent. How long your relationship with this BGP neighbor has been in its current state. Hopefully that state will be the established state. If it is the established state, the state column will be blank. If you do have an established relationship, the last column shows the number of BGP network entries that you received from the neighbor. As always, there are debug commands to help you figure out what's going on. So here, we've established a neighbor relationship. So here, we've brought down our relationship with our neighbor 10.1.0.2. It comes up again. And we send out an update to our neighbor to inform it about network 10.1.1.0, slash 24, and to inform it about that 97.97.0. We receive an update from our neighbor that lets us know about these two paths. As always, turn off debugging as soon as you can to conserve resources. If you have an established relationship, that means that you've got a good TCP connection and the two peers have agreed to BGP to communicate. 
You can see your neighbors via the show IPBGP Neighbors Command. You can see that we've been in the established state for just over 19 minutes. Now we're going to talk a little bit about regular expressions. Regular expressions are used not just with the Cisco IOS, but in many other contexts. You might want to use regular expressions in some programming languages. If you're writing Linux shell scripts, for example, you might wind up using regular expressions. They're very powerful ways of pattern matching. One reason you might wish to use regular expressions when you're using BGP is to specify via a route map to apply certain policies only to routes that match a particular regular expression. So you'll only be applying policies to some routes but not to others. So here Here's the syntax that we will be using for regular expressions. And note that the exact syntax for regular expressions might be a little bit different if you're using them in Linux shell scripting or in programming languages than they are here. So the syntax that's being used here is good for the Cisco IOS. or may not be good if you're using regular expressions in other contexts. So again, regular expressions are going to be used for pattern matching. A caret means the very start of the input string. And a dollar sign means the very end. An underscore will match spaces, commas, left braces, right braces, the beginning of an input string, or the ending of an input string. A dot will match any one character, and an asterisk will match any zero or more characters. I think this will make more sense if you see some regular expressions in action. So if we issue the show IP BGP command on router C, we can see that we have information about these three routes. And these are the paths to get to those routes. But suppose now that the output of show IP BGP was huge, as it likely would be in real life. And furthermore, suppose we only were interested in seeing information about routes where the first autonomous system number listed in the path is 300. We could tell router C to only show us those paths by issuing this command, show IP BGP reg x caret 300. This is saying only show us the routes that you know about that will match the regular expression listed here. You'll recall the caret means start of the string. So at the very start of the string, we need to have the characters 300. Zero, zero. That will specify only these two routes, not this one. And you'll note because we didn't have anything following the zero, we didn't have an underscore, we didn't have a dollar sign, we didn't have anything following the zero, this would also match if the next autonomous system number happened to be 3,000. So let's take a look at another example. Again, the same basic output for show IP BGP. Now we would like to see just this route, the route that has 200 in its path. But if we issue the same command that we had before, substituting 200 for 300, we're not going to see that. Because this would only show routes that have, as their first autonomous system number, a number that begins with 200. If we wished to specify that 200 must occur somewhere in the path, and it can't be 2,000, it has to be just 200, what could we do? We'll go back to this table and see if you could figure out, on your own first, what we would need to type. And I'll give you a hint. This is the row that is of interest. We want to make sure that we're matching against something that is either the start of the line or space, specifically, followed by 200, followed by either the end of the string or another space, specifically. So what we would need to issue would be show IP BGP reg X space underscore 200 underscore. That would get us this and only this route as output. OK, stop and think a moment to see if you can figure out what the output would be of this command. The I is not included. We're just looking at autonomous system numbers here. The only path here that ends dollar sign meaning the very last part of it has to be 300. The only one that ends with 300 is this route. Again, this also would have displayed any routes whose path ended with 1300 as well. 
if we wanted to make sure that it only was matched 300 and not 1300, we could have put an underscore before this three. So if we issue the show IP BGP regex 200 dollar sign, it will match this route. How about this? What do you think this will match? Hopefully, you realize it would match not only this and this route, which include uh, the AS System 100, but also the one that would include AS 1000, because 1000 contains the string 100 in it. Okay, how about this? What do you think this would match? And again, just as a reminder, hopefully, you would see oh, at the start of the line, the very first character has to be 1. Followed by zero, followed by a zero, followed by something that's not a number, specifically a space, a comma, left brace, right brace, beginning of the string, and hopefully what you came up with would then match these two, but it would not match this. How about this one? We have an underscore, followed by a four zero zero, followed by a dollar sign. A reminder of what the characters mean. This is saying we need to have any one of these special characters followed by a 400, followed by the end of the input string. So given this, what should this match? Hopefully you came up with that it would match only this network. Why does it not match the 10 network? Because we do have one of the special characters. We have a space followed by a 400, but then what follows the second zero is not immediately the end of the input string. There's another space afterwards. So what this is saying is that we have to have 400 at the end of the regular expression. How about this one? Underscore 400 underscore. This will match any network that has 400 anywhere in its path as an autonomous system. It would not match a 4,000, though, for example. And one last one. Carrot, 300, dollar sign. Well, at this point, hopefully you have memorized that the dollar sign means the end of the input string. The caret means the start of the input string. What this says is this will match all and only those networks that have 300 as the only autonomous system in the path. In other words, it will match our three network here and only our three network. In our second video, we spoke extensively about WLAM and about the entire decision-making process. We talked about which tiebreakers are used first. We talked about which tiebreakers do you prefer higher numbers versus lower numbers. We talked about WLAM, that the four most commonly used tiebreakers are weight and local preference, both of which prefer higher numbers, autonomous system path, and MED, both of which prefer lower numbers. One thing that we didn't talk about, though, is how can you make changes to the different attributes? So let's look first at changing the weight. Is the W in WLAM, the four, common, the four attributes that are most commonly used for uh, path decisions. Weight, you'll recall, is a Cisco attribute that is configured on a router for use on that router only. It is not advertised to other routers. And if you don't configure a weight, a route that originates from that router is going to have a default weight of 32,768. All other routes will have default weights of zero. You'll recall the W of WLAM is capitalized, meaning that higher weights are more preferred. So let's look at this situation. R1 can send packets to networks within AS65020, either via R2 or via R4. The administrator wishes the packets to be sent via R2. 
R1's administrator wishes the packets to be sent via R2. So we're going to give R2's routes higher weight than R4's. The commands that we're going to be seeing below are not all the commands that would be necessary for this configuration, but only the commands necessary for specifying weights. So here we're configuring R1 to, be, uh, to have 65040 as its autonomous system number. And then in addition to any other neighbor commands that we would have, we would have the following. Neighbor, R4's address, and we're assigning that a weight of 1,000. If we stopped there, we would be sending packets destined for this autonomous system through R4 rather than R2, because the weight of 1,000 is higher than the default weight of 0. However, we're not stopping there. We're giving neighbor R2 a higher weight, a weight of 2,000. Higher weight to preferred, so packets that R1 is going to be sending into this autonomous system would be via R2 rather than R4. But now suppose we want all routes that are destined to this autonomous system to go through R2. If we did that, we wouldn't be making very efficient use of this link. Instead, we'd like to have some going through R2, some going through R4. And we're going to illustrate this with one network in particular, this network. So we want to have a routing policy that is going to say specifically, if you wish to get to this network, you go to R2. Let's see how we'll do that. So we're going to be issuing a statement, a neighbor statement, with regards to R2. And any inbound update received from R2 we're going to apply route map RM set weight. So what does this route map look like? We're going to be trying to match IP addresses for the networks being advertised in the update against this prefix list. OK, then, what does this prefix list look like? This prefix list is going to match only the network that we're interested in changing the weight for. So when we see this network, what are we going to do? We're going to set it weight to 40,000. For all other routes being advertised in the update, we don't have any set command. We're just going to permit them. We're going to allow them to be advertised in, but we're just going to keep their default weights. So let's look at another example. Here, we are AS24. We do not wish to be a transit system. So we want to accept only default routes. We want to make sure that we tie routes that originated within our autonomous system to our ISPs, but we do not announce routes learned from one ISP into another. We wish to be non-transit. So how do we go about doing that? We establish neighbor relationships with our BGP neighbors in each of the two ISPs. We're setting different weights so that we would prefer to use the path via ISP2 to get to a given network. We're going to be setting neighbor commands for each of our eBGP peers that are going to be making use of a prefix list called default only, and it's going to be applied to inbound communications. The prefix list is going to permit 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0, so it's going to match to 0 bits. You'll recall with prefix list, if you don't specify a GE or an LE, it will have to be that length exactly. So this will only match the default route. It will match anything up to zero bits, but the length of the prefix has to be zero as well. So only the default route will be matched. So therefore, we will only allow into our system the default route. If the ISPs advertise that anything other than the default route, we're not going to be making use of that other information. We're going to be making use of a route map to send out information about routes that were originated locally. We are going to be advertising only those routes that match AS path 99. OK, so what is 99? 99 is a special type of access list called an AS path access list. And an AS path access list will be using regular expressions to specify which paths are going to be matched. Here. We are matching anything where the path begins, has nothing, and then ends. So this will match only the empty path. The path would be empty only for routes that were originating within our own autonomous system. 
Let's turn our attention now to local preference. In local preference, the L and P are capitalized, reminding you that higher local preferences are preferred. Local preferences are not local to the individual router, but they are local to an individual autonomous system. So local preferences can be shared between I BGP neighbors, but not between E BGP neighbors. Local preference is a 32-bit number with a default value of 100. Again, higher values are preferred. The command used to change the local preference is BGP default local preference, and you specify the number. So as things are now set up on C, if we issue the show IP BGP, we can see that each of the networks, we have two different possible paths. The greater than symbol is indicating our preferred path. In each of these cases, we have equal weights of zero. In each of these cases, we've got the default local preference 100. In a situation like this, the tiebreaker is going to be half length. Shortest path is better. Now we're going to be looking at communication amongst the three highlighted networks. To get to 172.16.0.0, we're going to be going through X. To get to 172.24.0.0, we're going to go through Y. To get to 172.30.0.0, we're again going to go through Y. Well, this is all well and good until we do a traffic analysis. And from here, we learn that things are not being equally utilized. So the link connecting V to Y is very heavily used, but the link connecting A to X is not being used very much. We've determined that the three networks that we're sending the most traffic to are, coincidentally enough, our three highlighted networks. Furthermore, we learned that 30% of our internet traffic is going to 172.24.0.0 via router B. Another 20% is going to 172.30.0.0, again, via router B. 10% is going to 172.16.0.0 via router A. And the other 40% traffic is going somewhere else on the internet. So this means that currently 50% of our internet traffic is going through router B. Only 10% is going through router A. We've decided to make things a little bit more even by making it so that traffic destined for this network will go via router A rather than via router B. The way we're going to make this happen is by changing local preference for the route to 172.30.0.0. And this will enable better load balancing. So let's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be setting up a route map that's going to be linked to router X as an inbound route map. So we're going to be making some changes to router A so that when it receives up from router X with regards to this network, we're going to be increasing the local preference. How are, we, how are we going to be doing that? With the neighbor command with regard to X that we're configuring on router A. And this neighbor command is saying we're going to be making use of a route map called local prep, and this route map is going to be applied to traffic inbound from this neighbor. The route map is going to be matching IP addresses as specified by Access List 65. Access List 65 specifies only our network in question. And for that particular network, we're going to set a local preference of 400. But if we stop here with just sequence 10, any other routes that we might otherwise have learned about from router X, we would not learn about because our route map would be black enough. So we have a second route map statement, permit 20. It says anything else, we're just going to allow through. We don't have any match statement, so we match everything. We don't have any set statement, so we don't do anything specifically. We're not changing uh, the local preference for these other routes, so they're going to keep their default preference of 100. This will let us have routing that we would like to have. So all of the other routes that we know about from any source keep their default local preferences, but the one route in question, the route to 172.30.0.0 via router X is given a local preference of 400, which is higher than the route learned via Y. Therefore, it will be the preferred route. Now, we talked briefly about AS prepending before. 
it's very easy to set policies within your autonomous system to influence which path outbound traffic will take. It's a lot harder to influence other autonomous systems with regard to traffic inbound into your own autonomous system. You can specify the MED, but you'll recall from WLAM, path length is going to be used as a tiebreaker before you get to the MED. So that would only influence situations in which an autonomous system knows two different ways to get to a network via your autonomous system, and they both have the same length. You could also make communication with uh, the operator in the autonomous system and ask, hey, could you set your attributes in such a way? They're probably not going to be wanting to do that. The thing that you're most likely to be wanting to do is AS prepending. Again, because the shortest path is the preferred path, by default, if R4 wanted to send traffic into this autonomous system number, it would send it directly to R1. If you want the traffic to be going through R2, what you can do is you can make sure that the path that R4 sees to get to R1 is longer than the path R4 sees to get to R2. The way you can do that is you can prepend your autonomous system number a series of times on the path that you're advertising via R1 to R4. And the only number that you are going to be prepending is your own autonomous system number. Because keep in mind that the paths are used not only for determining the shortest path to prefer, but also as a mechanism to make sure that you don't have any loops involved. So how would R1 go about pending its autonomous system number? So here in router BGP configuration mode, when communicating with R4, we're going to be making use of the route map set AS path out. This route map does not have any match statement, so this is going to be applied to all of the routes that we're going to be sending to AS65010. All of those routes will take whatever the path that we might otherwise have sent out, and to that path we will attach beginning our autonomous system number three times. R4 then will see routes with 65040 four times, the three that we're prepending because of this statement, plus the one instance of 65040 that we would just normally be prepending to the path before we send out the update. So now paths for this particular network, as far as R4 is concerned, can be reached with a path of four if you go through R1, or via path of one, two, three if you go via R5. All else being equal, shortest path will win. You'll recall in our second video, we talked about the MED, lower MED being preferred. MED only coming into play when you've got two different routes learned from the same autonomous system. So how can we set these MEDs? Here on R2, we would like to have an MED of 150 for all routes that were advertising to R1. And R3, we want to have the MED be 200. And this is how we can do this. And R2, amongst other neighbor statements we have, we're going to be having a neighbor statement for our R1 neighbor, to which we're going to be applying the route map set MED to outbound update. And this route map is going to be using a prefix list to specify the network whose MED we would like to have changed. For this particular network, we're going to be setting the metric. Again, metric and MED are in the context of EGP. So we're setting the MED by set metric, and we're going to set the metric to 150. Again, we need the second route map statement that doesn't have any matches or sets, so that we will continue to send out information about all of the other networks that we would otherwise send out. And we have something basically identical on router 3, the only difference being that here we're going to be setting the metric to 200. Now, if we have a setup like this, where we have the MED as 1001 to go from 65001 into 65004 via X, with a lower MED to get into this autonomous system via Y, and that's the change we make, we might not have appropriate utilization of our links. So if we didn't have any earlier tiebreakers that were in effect, then all traffic from this autonomous system to this one would go through this B to Y link. B 
because it's the one that has the lower MED. So a solution to that would be to set the MEDs for only some routes and not for others. The rest of today's discussion is going to be showing you some examples that will be making use not only of BGP, but also of a lot of concepts that were introduced in earlier chapters. So we'll start off with filtering BGP updates. Again, you might wind up getting a lot of updates, and you might wish to filter those updates. And you can do so with filter lists, with prefix lists, and with route maps, either for the incoming updates or for the outgoing ones, so that you're only going to be sending some but not all of the BGP table to your neighbor. So the incoming filter will say only the permitted routes that are received from the neighbor will be accepted into the BGP table. The outgoing filters will say that only the permitted routes will be sent to the neighbors. So here we're using a prefix list to determine what routes we're going to be accepting from our neighbor. And this prefix list will match any route that has a mask that's at least 8 and is less than 24. Again, there's an implicit deny so that any other routes would not be accepted. Now let's look at PGP filtering using a route map. The route map, the neighbor, the IP address, the neighbor, the keyword route map, the name of the route map, and then what this route map is being applied to inbound or outbound traffic. So here, router A is multi-homed to two different ISPs. Both neighbors are going to have their routes filtered based on the neighbor route map filter in command, and the word filter is not a Cisco iOS keyword. The word filter is the name of our route map. The first route map statement, and we've got two different route map statements for filter command. The first one has two different match statements. You recall when you've got multiple match statements, all of the match conditions must be met. They're added together. Our first test is to see whether the IP address is permitted by the prefix list named def only. This prefix list will permit only the default route. Again, with prefix, prefix lists that don't have a GE or an LE, will match only those routes that have this exact prefix link. So any route will match to zero bits, but only a default route will have a slash zero prefix. So we're saying that if the route is a default route and the route matches the AS path access list number 10, the AS path access list number 10 specifies that not only is this particular route learned from AS65, Three, eight, seven, but it also originates from it. So the entire path consists of just the string 65387, the AS number for our primary. So if both of those conditions are met. In other words, if the route in question is a default route that's being advertised from our primary ISP, set the weight to 150. Our second route map command also specifies if it's a default route, there's no second match to try to compare our time system numbers. So if it's any other default route that we learn about, we're going to set the weight to 100. There's a deny at the end here, so we won't accept any other routes. We're only accepting default routes such that the primary ISP's default route is going to be given a weight of 150. The backup default route is going to be given a weight of 100. As you know, higher weights are preferred. So as long as our primary link is up, everything's going well, we'll be sending traffic to our primary ISP. If that link goes down, we can't send things to our primary ISP. We'll send them to our backup ISP. Yet another filtering BGP example. Here we have a multi-home situation. We have connections to two separate ISPs, and we have BGP connections to each of our ISPs. Again, we want to make sure that our organization does not become a transit autonomous system. So we do not want to advertise routes learned from one ISP to the other ISP. We only want to advertise originated within our own autonomous system. The way we can do that is we can create an AS path access list that's only going to match the empty path. So this will only match networks that we did not learn from other autonomous systems. They're networks that originated within ourselves. And we're going to apply that filter list outbound in our connections to each of our two ISPs. Another example of filtering using route maps. Here again, we're multi-home. We only wish to accept default routes. We're going to be changing the local preference for our primary ISP 
to be higher than the default of 100, so that we'll be using local preference as our decision maker. The established neighbor relationships with the EGP routers in each of our two ISPs, and we're going to apply inbound a route map called filter to routes learned via either one. The route map is going to refer to a prefix list called default only that, once again, is only going to permit default routes coming inbound. If the AS path matches the autonomous system number for ISP1, we're going to set the local preference to 150. We have another route map statement that if we're receiving, again, a default route, we will accept it. No set statements. We're not doing anything without making any changes, but we will accept it. And then those are the only prefixes that we will accept. I've made mention of peer groups periodically in our discussion. In real life, you might have a lot of routers within your autonomous system that you would wish to run BGP on. And they're all going to have very nearly identical configurations. Rather than having to apply the same policies individually on each of these routers, you can create a peer group for the different routers and apply the policies once. I liken this almost to Ether channel with switch network, where you apply, for example, the duplex configuration to the Ether channel, and that configuration then percolates to each of the individual ports. In the same way, if you apply policies to a peer group, that policy will, will be applied to each of the members of the peer group. You can create a peer group with the command neighbor, give the peer group a name, and peer group. Then you can add specific neighbors to the peer group with the command neighbor, IP address, peer group, name the peer group. So here's an example. Here we've created the peer group called ISP, and we put our EGP neighbor for both ISP1 and ISP2 in the peer group that we're calling ISP. We are then doing some filtering based on the ISP peer group. So instead of saying neighbor 209.165.201.1, filter list 10 out. And then a separate neighbor 209.165.201.5, filter list 10 out, and so on. We just have a neighbor command. We make mention of the peer group. And then we have filter list, prefix list, route maps that are going to be applied to both this neighbor and this neighbor. And this one single example summarizes quite a number of skills that you've learned during this course. So first of all, we're applying an outbound filter list based on access list 10. So we're going to be advertising only routes originating within our own system, so we're not going to be a transit autonomous system. Inbound, we're only going to be accepting desired subnets, and the desired subnets will be the default route and any route that has a prefix link between 8 and 24 inclusive. We're also going to be applying a route map inbound such that any routes that were learned directly from 65100 are going to be given the local preference of 150, and everything else will be allowed in just with their default I'll give you a few minutes right now to look at this and just see on your own, can you figure out what this is doing? You might wish to pause the video right now. Hopefully this is what you came up with. So we've talked about BGP standing for Border Gateway Protocol, but BGP also stands for one other thing. Big Gala Party, which you should give yourself because we've just finished our discussion on Border Gateway Protocol.